Um, the Exodus reading, chapter 20, and I'll just read verse 3 and 4 for you again. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Dear Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit on us, so that we may not place our trust in anything or anyone but our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. If you were asked if you've made an idol for yourself, you'd most likely say no. And you'd probably say no because most people think of an idol as a statue of a god. That is, God with a little g. But what if you are really to challenge yourself by realising it is not just our hands that can make an idol but our hearts that can build idols, and quite often much more easily than our hands. An idol could be anything your heart relies on, desires or trusts, which isn't the one true God. Martin Luther in his large catechism says, anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say, that is really your God. So then it seems that our hearts can both trust in the one true God, but at the same time, also make an idol. Especially if we understand an idol is anything our heart is clinging to, relying on or desiring, which is not God. One test to see if you have an idol or not is to consider anything you might have or want to have, which you simply can't do without. The test becomes real when you consider how you react when something or someone that you're relying on is taken away from you. I'm not talking about the essentials of life, such as air, food or water. I'm talking about the things our hearts cling to, whether an object, a person or even a concept. Let's think about a car, for instance, which makes me think about the first car that I ever owned. It was a famous, sorry, infamous Datsun Sunny. It was a lovely, sorry, ugly, light blue colour and the colour was fading. It went from 0 to 100 in about 9.6 kilometres. <laughs> it was a modest car, no, it was really a piece of junk. Having said that, it did mostly get me from point A to point B. But I was pretty sure that if there were idols in my life at that time, it wasn't that car. However, let's say someone smashed or stole my car. To be honest, it's highly unlikely anyone would have stolen it, but let's just say they did. I had insurance to fix or replace it, so there would have been no problem, right? But what would it have meant to me if I couldn't use the car for an extended period? Or what would it mean for you if you couldn't use your car? Would it just be inconvenient? Or would it be a major catastrophe? Not having a car would be a pain in the neck, but most of us would survive. But for some it might be different, because it's not so much about the car, but what the car represents. Maybe a car represents our independence, or our freedom. Maybe without it, we would struggle with having to rely on others. We wouldn't want to bother, be a bother to them. Feeling you're a burden to someone may really upset you. You don't want to inconvenience anyone and you don't want to be inconvenienced. In this instance, your heart has learned to rely on yourself and your access to a car. So if you couldn't use your car for whatever reason, you may grieve the loss of it more than you first realised. It's not that your car was so important or that it was an idol in itself, but your reliance on it to maintain your independence or your freedom or even your identity as a person who is willing to help others maybe these desires could become a form of an idol. Now, of course, you're not relying on your car for salvation, but your dependence and reliance on having a car could result in a very strong reaction if it or your ability to use it is taken away. When you have strong reactions to losing something, it means your heart felt it needed it for some reason and that God isn't the only good thing you're relying on. In this case, God becomes jealous because you're flirting with something else to supply your perceived needs. You could argue that God loves to give us many good things, 
and blesses us with many possessions. And yes, that is true. If God didn't want us to own anything, then there would be no need for the seventh commandment, you shall not steal. There'd be no need for the ninth and tenth commandments either, because no one would have anything to steal or covet. So yes, God created all good things for us. And we may enjoy many wonderful blessings through them. But if we start to rely on them so much that our hearts grieve if those things are taken away or even threatened, then they could represent for us an idol. It may not be because they themselves are an idol, but they represent something we're relying on for our own good. We may be relying on what God creates and gives to us rather than God himself. Let's consider another example, this time a concept. Let's say you desire to have a good sense of self-worth. This is a bit more intangible and it doesn't rely on you having an object in itself. For this reason you'll rarely find a statue representing your self-worth in your homes. But that doesn't mean your heart isn't set on it. Seeking to have a good sense of self-worth isn't a bad thing in itself. In fact, you might agree that God wants you to have a good sense of self-worth and doesn't want you to feel worthless or stupid or inferior or foolish. But what do you do if you don't feel worthy enough for God or for anyone else or even for yourself? What do you do if your own sense of self-worth is challenged because of health issues, a change in circumstances or because of something you or someone else has done? Do we beat ourselves up? Do we judge or want to punish others for suggesting we're not as good as we thought we were? Do we experience bouts of depression? Do we wonder how people could love us? And in response, do we try to do things such as lie, cheat or manipulate others? Do we doubt God's love for us? And do we promise to do things for him to make up for what we've done or not done? Could it be that our need for feeling of self-worth has become so important that we no longer look to God to feel complete? Could it be that Christ's covering of his holy, innocent and perfect blood, which makes us worthy and righteous and pure in God's eyes, is no longer enough? Could it be that our status as a holy child of God isn't sufficient for us? When our heart clings to anything else other than God himself and what he supplies through the words and works of Jesus Christ, it's most likely making an idol, even if there's no little golden statue to prove it. Our actions and reactions alone prove our hearts are trusting idols. Our hearts are idol factories, which not only love to crave what God has forbidden for us, but also love to turn the good things of God, which we receive by grace, into essential things we have to have in order to feel whole, complete, happy and fulfilled. Even our desire to be good little Christians who God loves because of our goodness can become an idol because our heart often wants to cling to self-righteousness rather than an objective righteousness given as a free and undeserved gift through faith alone. In this way, our hearts learn to rely on the gifts more than the giver. The created things become more essential than the one who created them. Our words and works become more holy and virtuous than the words and works of Jesus Christ. Our hearts become clogged with worthless idols and it shows in the way we treat each other and the way we relate to God. So every day Jesus wants to come to the temples of our hearts and clean them out. He's rightly angry about the idols we gather and cling to in our hearts. The more idols our hearts make and rely on, the less room there is for the words and works of Christ. The answer for our idol-making hearts is repentance and faith. Repentance of everything we've learnt to rely on or desire, which isn't God himself. Repentance of everything, sorry, repentance of the way we treat each other because they didn't give us our heart's desires. 
Repentance of the way we didn't fear, love or trust God above all things. We also look to God in faith. We trust Jesus is able to cleanse our hearts from the idols which lead us to sin. And so he can create pure and clean hearts which look to him to satisfy our deepest needs. We trust that Jesus' work of obedience is fully sufficient to make up for all the times we fail to keep God's commands because Jesus alone is truly able to love God and keep his commands for us. We trust that Jesus took our full guilt and received our full punishment for all of our sins, not just for the ways we have hurt God and others, but also for the times we relied on anything or anyone else except God for our righteousness. We trust in the forgiveness of God who shows his gracious love to thousands of those who, because they've received the righteousness of Christ through faith, love him and keep his commands. We trust that God alone is our hope, our joy, our strength, our shelter, our solitude, our redeemer, our defender, our comfort, and the one who promises wholeness, completeness, and health, especially in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard our hearts and minds in Christ.